Yo! Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Hold on. Can everyone hear me? One second, guys. Okay, good, good, good. Give me guys one second, because I think we're, we're waiting for Tessa to join. I am not attending the PCAs, obviously. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> what am I drinking? It is a kombucha. I like kombucha. I'm not attending the PCAs. If I'm here, I am, obvi I am definitely not attending the PCAs. Why do I seem sad? <laughs> yeah, so Tessa will start, will join, and then we will start our conversation. Um, whew, I am loving this book. I, I don't know about everyone else. I think it's amazing. Um, Tessa Masi joined. Yes. Okay. You're silent, My though. How do I? There you go. Okay. Why? Why is mine cropped? Because I'm cropped as well now. No, but like um, mine. Like, sorry, like it's not cropped, but it's like it has a black border on it. Is it better if I do this? No. It's worse. Okay. Yeah. I would stay like this because I can see your face perfectly. Can everyone see Tessa's face perfectly? Because I, I can see Tessa's face perfectly. And I'm sitting back so that my face is seen well. Um, do this. I'm really stuck. Are we ready to go? Okay. There you go. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> So let's um, dive right in. Uh, Tessa and I have been talking, and Tessa was caught up on her reading much faster than I am, or I was. So she has been like trying not to spoil things for me and waiting for me to catch up, and it's been very difficult. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't really spoil anything though. I, I was just. I had made some predictions very, very early on in the book. So even though they ended up being spoilers, I didn't know that information at the time either. And then there was also the uh, idea that you were, uh, because of the show. Because yeah. the show plays a big role, yeah. I guess, in what's happening here. Um, I, have, I am not caught up on the show. We will not really be talking about the show. We'll be talking about the books specifically in uh, in how the books affect each other. I know the show has other parts to it that inform things and stuff, but um, I can't speak to that. So uh, give me one second while I finish because my iPad is sideways right now. Yeah, I'm really struggling here. Like, my phone is actually kind of calm. What? My phone is like... Um, like it's it's really playing a dangerous game where it's going to fall at any moment, but I don't know how to fix it. 
Okay, hold on. Let me do this. Every time. That's not it. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, no show comments. Okay. Um, okay, Tessa, you've been warned. Can I ask a question though? How, um, how have guys been receiving, like how, how has everybody been receiving the books who have seen the show and do you feel like it's really informing the way that you're absorbing the book and it would be a different read if you hadn't seen the show? No, one last time, we will not be attending the PCAs. So let's, we can skip that question, guys. <laughs> um, so Tessa's question was, if you have seen the show, is it informing the way you read the book? And you don't need to talk about specifics, so that way we can let everybody, you, could just say, you know. Yeah. You could just say. Because I'm struggling with, like, a lot of comments I have that I feel are really, really informing the way I'm viewing the entire book is based on knowledge that I accumulated from watching the show, which she seemed to, because she was one of the writers on the show, she's using that information in this book. So, um, and by the end of the book, we'll all be caught up and in the same spot, but I, I feel like this is one of the books that you have to go back and reread if you don't know the information at the beginning, because you want to like, be able to fully absorb it in the way that I've been able to because of the show. Mm. Okay, people are saying, some people feel the same way. All right, let's, let's go back to the beginning and let's start off the way that we start every book. Let's do one word answers what we're thinking about this book. Do you yeah. love it? Do you hate it? Are you scared by it? I'm, I, am, I, I will say I'm disturbed and I'm fascinated, and I'm uh, excited, but at the same time, afraid. Uh, fascinating, love it. Thank you, Annie Hansen. Dark, thank you, Camille. Intense, I agree. Um, what's the story about? Uh, you have to read the book. Uh, scary, page turn. Totally loving it. Love that. Intrigued. That's your word. Okay. A little big, sad, and creepy, but wow. Okay. Absolutely incredible. Still been caught up. Got so many things to do. Okay. Intrigued. Awesome. I like how people use that word. Confronting. Okay. Confronting. Keep that word. I wonder why you're saying confronting. Um, interesting. You're curious, Madam Call. Intriguing. I like the book a lot. All right. Is there anyone that's not liking this book and why? Love it more than The Handmaid's Tale. I have to say, uh, I, I think because it's a little more active, The Handmaid's Tale felt a little passive in the sense that she was bringing us into this world, whereas this book feels like she knows we're in this world and now she's trying to like, it feels like less of an account, even though it's just as much of an account in the past as The Handmaid's Tale was, it feels like we're part of the story in a different way and we're not just hearing about it, you know? What do you think, T? Yeah, also, I mean, just the way that it's set up, where it's it's people telling stories of something like that has already happened. Whereas in Handmaid's Tale, like we were very much like, but it's been so long since I read it, so I'm trying not to confuse, but we were, we were there as it was happening, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? So this you is, mean? you're right, it does feel like, I think, Although it's so awful what's happening, it feels like there's a little bit more hope in, in Yeah, this. it doesn't look as decided. But then again, that, that's, we're looking through completely different windows. In The Handmaid's Tale, we're looking at, through the window of a handmaid, whereas here we're looking yeah. through the window of an escapee, like a refugee, Aunt Lydia, probably the most powerful woman in that world, <clears throat> and then the daughter of a high-level commander. So... Even in that world, these, we're looking at two women that have privilege in that world, and then one woman that wasn't aware that she was given so much and, and is now kind of learning about her past. Yeah. 
So I, I feel like we're, we're in a completely different <laughs> mindset. Aunt Lydia can choke. Rita. <laughs> um, I have to say, I, I've been listening to the audiobook, which I think is really cool, because I believe the actress that plays Aunt Lydia reads Aunt Lydia's portion. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's like this informed perspective, and it really does lend itself to us, to the feeling that we're like, reading Aunt Lydia's thoughts in the past. Like, to me, that's kind of cool how we're, we're hearing why and how she does that and how she's like, and the choices she's made. And that's like the biggest thing is that for her, it was all a, a, like, it wasn't a choice, but it was like, she, I don't know. I'm wondering if that was when Margaret Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale, if she originally had this backstory for Aunt Lydia or this is something that she thought about later. Well, I feel like, remember we listened to Elizabeth Moss's, um, we listened to her podcast for Off Camera. And if you guys don't know, Off Camera is this really cool actor's podcast that I, I really enjoy. This guy named Sam Jones does it. And uh, he interviews creative, curious artists and tries to find out how they got that way. And he did that with Elizabeth Moss. And she was so impressed with the performance of Aunt Lydia. Um, what was I going? Why was I? Why was I going this way, TV? You know why? why was I, I yeah, I, I do think I. I think I know why. Um, because you're saying how. Um, oh, okay. The actor plays it like this is genuinely her belief system, mm -hmm. and she's really excited to help these women find their faith. Exactly, and I think that the writing of Aunt Lydia's character in this book feels like a. It feels almost like a. Not an exercise, but uh, and it's like she's trying to discover how someone can choose to like do this, you know, how, how someone who had had a job and and, and a, like a position and, and and was like a free person was able to have everything taken away and then use that as an opportunity to kind of get something back, that little bit of power that she has and that she holds on to. It's like, a survival mechanism. And, and how she even admits it. She's like, this is how I survived. And, you know, she, yeah, it, total 1984 vibes, Rita. Like, I, I completely agree. And I think it's fascinating that we're, we're learning that every, every time something like this happens, there are people that work with it instead of against it. That's something that I think is crazy is that, like, in every totalitarian regime that's ever come up, there are people that had power before that wanted to, mean, that want to maintain that power. So they end up joining a regime that they don't agree with to, uh, to survive. Yeah. So I, I feel like you, you see Pat, you see like behind the curtain of Aunt Lydia, but that doesn't make you kind of hate her any less. You just start, you kind of understand her in a different way. I think, how do you feel? <clears throat> I mean, what would you do in that situation where you're, you're given basically the choice to like fight and survive or to die those were basically your choices and and then we discussed this already on our own because we were chatting about the book as we were reading but then she got greedy like mm -hmm. she just kept taking it and like there's a there's a difference between like survival stories of people who like learned how to like work the system so that they could like you know either make it out alive or so that they could help other people get out of there or whatever they, whatever they're, whatever they were trying to do. But then there's a difference between being like, and while I'm here, I'm going to enjoy it. Like <laughs> she, she had to have enjoyed like in Handmaid's Tale, she was like torturing those girls. And, and granted, if she didn't do it, people would think that she wasn't legit, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's so hard to, I'll never be in that position, so... No, it's, 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 it's her game. Like, she's the only way that I can continue with this power and, and, and grow with it and change it and, and be able to do it is if I believe it. If, I, you know, if, if she enforces things the way that she does. Uh, also, the more you, like, you live that every single day, the more your brain and your body are like, oh, okay, this is, this is my new normal. And she said that in the Hammond Tale, it was one of her lines, was that this will become your new normal. And that's exactly what ha happened to her, where like she had to make a choice and she's a smart, smart lady. So she knew how 
something like this would actually work for her and for other people and how to control these people effectively. Yeah. Just crazy. Um, and it became her new normal theory. I, I think her, her journey is one of the most fascinating. Um, just to kind of like, because in the other book, she was such a pillar of that world. And then in this book, to find out that she wasn't always, she wasn't there when they were hatching the plans of how to take over the United States with how, how Gilead was going to rise to power. She wasn't one of the people that did yes. that. She was and just someone her. that, yeah, she was just a complete like opportunist in a way to see yeah. like, all right, there's an opportunity for me to, to, to maintain some sort of power. And, and to, to I, I, I think like, we can't look past the genius that she has. I mean, this, th what gets me is like, I understand like trying to make it by, but what I don't understand is when they had that moment where, oh, wait, I'm, I don't want to say it in case that we haven't reached that part in the book yet. I'm not going to say it. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to kill me. Uh, Oh, but it's really Do not ever let Tessa like get ahead because then she no, does the spoilers. Do That's why I'm not saying as much as I'm trying to like follow your lead. <laughs> so everyone knows Tessa finished the book in like three days. It was amazing, guys. <laughs> I, it down. I also got it from the library and because it's hot off the press, I only had seven days to read it. So I read it in two. So she crushed it and then now she's like holding her tongue. Yeah. Which is so frustrating because you know like whenever I start oh, to get somewhere with it she's like oh i can't i can't talk any further and i'm like ah um but let's talk so you're about making really good points alberto and i'm gonna write down what i just thought of so i can bring up to the next slide good idea um so let's just talk about what we're doing in this book so uh for those of you that are, are reading and catching on let's just do this as a quick summary so we are entering the world of the, the world of the handmaid's tale um looking at accounts of this world from the future into the past and we're looking at three different women telling their story we're looking at Daisy, who we should know if everyone's caught up at this point. If you're not, I'm going to start telling spoilers from as far as we know. So if you're not caught up and you want to read this book, if you're here, this is your chance to leave. Yeah, <laughs> true. This is your chance to leave before I ruin anything. So you have five more seconds, and then I'm going to keep talking. All right. So... We're entering this world, speaking from this perspective of three different women, Aunt Lydia, who now we kind of know her past. We know that she was this judge beforehand and that she was exalted into this position of power by her own genius and her own willingness to kind of like push, the, like really look forward and say, all right, I can't go backwards. That world's done. There's no chance. I'm only going to be like, how do I make this work for myself? We're also Daisy, uh, a refugee from Gilead whose mother was able to sneak her across the border. And, and kind of get a better life for her. And then Agnes Jemima, who we find out whose mother was a handmaid and uh, was given to Tabitha and of Kyle, a very powerful commander. And it, it's her perspective into this. And now we know that both of these girls, right, Tess, we know that both of these girls have the same. I don't think we. Okay. You know I have a speculation. I, can I say that? Can I say my speculation? Well, I, I've been reading the comments and I see somebody else has the same. Okay. Um, I, I'm seeing it now too. Connected. Yeah. Daisy as baby Nicole. I predicted that too. Tessa was like, good job, Alberto. Proud of you. You've been paying attention. And I'm like, yeah. And then <laughs> I, I the, 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 it's like two pages though. It's, it's such a cool. Oh, it's, anyway. Okay. Cool. And then the other one, Agnes Jemima also being June's daughter that she had in Right? That's what I think. I was sorry, say that last part again. I was reading the oh, that, that Agnes Jemima is also June's daughter, but the one from within Gilead, the one that was born there because of uh Right. Because I tried to do like, okay, how much time has really passed here and um and also I I was trying to remember in Hammond's tale I thought they told us what they renamed um, June's daughter. Yeah, I, I, and I'm pretty sure they said Agnes, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, 
the minute I saw Agnes, because that's also like such a specific name, I was like, oh, I am so excited that we're still attached. You're still connected to June in this book. Mm -hmm. I love that she did that. Oh, they renamed her Agnes McKenzie. And then what's her name in, in this one is Agnes? Agnes Jemima. But isn't Jemima her middle name? Yeah. Right? So Mackenzie's not her middle name? Mackenzie's your last name? I don't know. I wish I had my book here to reference. Um, yeah, does anybody know? Yeah, but Jemima is her middle name. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So we're on the same. Okay, Annie, awesome. don't ask questions that are spoilers. Will we also read about June in this book? Annie, I don't want to hear that answer because I don't know yet. Yeah. Uh, we don't know Commander Kyle's last name. That's true. Well, anyway, we're reading from these three very different perspectives. One of a girl born into the world of power, two, because of her father being uh, a commander, and all she's known is, like, the privilege of being a higher-up's daughter, which is pretty cool. Then we have the daughter, uh, a person that doesn't really know their past that then discovers that they were, their elite, they could be deported at any second from Canada, which I thought was a cool... She's like, I can leave any second. This is kind of really scary, actually. And then the third being an aunt, which I love that we're kind of seeing that part of the world as well. Um, yes. I think all three characters are fascinating to read about. My favorite is Agnes because we've not seen that perspective ever, mm -hmm. you know? Like, we have the perspective of Daisy where we're outside of the world looking into Handmaid's Tale and having our own opinions of it. Like we, you know, that's familiar to us, but this girl who grew up not knowing anything else but Gilead mm -hmm. is fascinating. And I felt myself like I wanted to keep like flipping pages to find her next section. But then obviously when I was reading Aunt Lydia and Daisy, I was just as, you, you know, invested. Involved, yeah, for sure. But, um, but I love reading about Agnes. I, I think her perspective is my favorite to read. Um, we, we've had this discussion. I don't know how you guys feel. Tess and I talked about this. We both kind of feel like Daisy's a little bit of a brat. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, which like, now I'm starting to like her more because she's putting herself on the line. She's like joining the, the cause, like the rebellion in a way, which I think is pretty badass. Um, and, and now we're at the point where we see that she's like actively training to return to Gilead as baby Nicole to... Yeah. And for lack of a better phrase, to kind of fuck shit up. So, like, <laughs> I'm, like, really excited about that. Do you remember what her first essay that she wrote about Gilead was about in school? Daisy's? No. Her, she wrote an essay about why don't they just return baby Nicole to Gilead if it's making everybody so mad. That's what she wrote. I was like, are you kidding? Anyway, and then obviously she grew up and didn't have those same opinions, but um, yeah, that, that where we ended is one of the coolest parts of the book. I'm like really happy where we ended by accident. Yes, like. yes, I think it was a perfect spot to choose because like it gives you so, this is what we're talking about, this is the hope that this book gives you that I love about the Testament. Yeah, okay, can you, can you explain that? Because I thought that was one of the coolest things you said to me was how the, the handmade, you started talking about it in the beginning of this, but okay. I think you could expand on that. Cause I think that is one of the coolest things about this book. If we compare it to the handmaid's tale, it's like the handmaid's tale, we're reading a past account. It, I do feel like someone in a lecture hall that was like just hearing these stories and actively getting like interested and upset and then, and then finding out at the end, like, Oh, they found this. Whereas this one, I feel as though I'm in the center of the action. And it's like more active because we we also get to be from different points of power where there is more opportunity to do something instead of just being a handmaid inside this world that's new and scary and it ends also the book ends at a point where we're like what what happened to her we don't we don't know so it's so nice to now be like okay there's a group of people who have figured out systems to hopefully break this place down or at least get people out of it. 
and now we're finally able to be a part of that and and then I think Daisy's storyline starts taking over because you're like okay let's do this let's do this like let's tear this place apart I'm wondering if I mean please don't let your face betray the answer to this question okay but I'm wondering if we ever get a world where we see Daisy and Agnes like together because Agnes is going to be going to Gilead and Daisy is from like a higher up so I feel like if baby Nicole were to return, they were to have a ceremony, like Agnes would totally be there because she's a possible powerful wife. That's or... another thing I thought of too, is like, because here's this girl from Canada who's writing the essay to return baby Nicole and then she ends up being baby, baby Nicole. Nicole. I mean... Going into like, and I kind of also don't want this to play out in a TV show. I want to see the movie of this book. Like, I, I want to see this as a movie. Yeah, I want to see the movie of this book, like one hundred percent. I read something. Am I wrong? I quickly saw something online that said that they were, Hulu was looking into doing something with, with this book. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. To me, it seems like they're in love with Margaret Atwood and the world she's created. I mean, they've done three yeah. seasons of this show. I, I would love if That's they not did like her only book that they're doing too. Yeah, I, I think it would be sick if they did. Like they did the show and then they used some of the same characters and did like a movie. I think this would be an incredible movie. I mean, I it's, it's, it's oh, I can't. And wait. then can we talk about just like the writing here? I, I think Margaret Atwood does an incredible job of not only showing us like her point of view on this, but yeah. also showing us the parallel to the world today. And I think that's the scariest part for me. The part that I found most disturbing was even though we're supposed to look at Gilead as this like hyper conservative other world, I mean, it's not to me. It, it's it's the United States right now. With I mean, it, it, hopefully our generation is changing some of it. But I, I, I see women still in a similar prison that they are in in Gilead, with men of power abusing that power, and then the the forced, uh, I guess. Alberto, you're like so dead on with like I got like goosebumps reading a lot of parts of it because you're thinking this is so isolated from me like this world is so different and I'm it made me want to enjoy my freedom and the rights that I have as a woman and then I would read other parts and I was relating way too much to what was going on and it really really freaked me out because why am I relating to something that's happening in this like in Gilead. <laughs> it's awful. And why is this still happening today in this free world? It's um it's awful and like what we were this the scene we were talking about um with the dentist was awful and unfortunately is not like so many women experience uh, things like this in their life and you read about it in the book and you're thinking okay but women here are protected but that's not it's working so I'm just like thank you Margaret Atwood for writing a book so that we can see how ridiculous it is to victim blame and we can see all of these things that well, I, I think one of the one of the life. things that I, one of the things I think Gilead does is in that structure of victim blaming and and that whole thing, you see almost like on a microscopic level how that what's it, that structure of power reinforces those in power. How how that structure of how things go, where the victims are the one and it's their fault, even though the commonality amongst all of it is that the men are the ones with this horrific violence inside them. And, 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 you know, it, it's, it's like common knowledge that it's it, the men are the ones. It, it, that's the thing that's the most ludicrous thing to me. It's like, we all know that it's the men committing these acts. And we all know that it's the men that they're propagators of this entire world of, like, abuse and, and control. But yet it's the women's In fault the because that enforces that power structure, which, for me, if anyone has an argument against that in our world today, I'm like, read this book and you'll be like, oh, wow, that's exactly how that is. And that's yeah. the most disturbing part is like it's disturbing. It's yeah. not, it's not at all science fiction. <laughs> like not, none of 
none of what she draws from is. It's that's why the book is is so effective because you see the way they made this world. The reason it's working in the world is because it has actually worked in real life. And abuse of power so that you can't say anything. Oh, also, the dentist is a man of like high esteem. You couldn't say something about him. They would blame no, him. He's a good I mean, dentist. Who cares if he's talented? Like, what? What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with respecting someone's body? Uh, yeah. What are people? It's the part where, uh, Maddie McCall, you're asking, what the situation is the part where Paula sends Agnes Jemima to the dentist for the first time alone. And after that, even the Martha, in their coded language, knew what had happened and was like, I should have gone with you. But don't forget, he's really respected. So like she said, in our coded language, she was saying, don't say anything, but I totally know what happened to you. Which is, yeah. I mean, so I don't know. I think, I think one of the things that, that's fascinating for me is being a man reading this book. Because in our world, we know it's horrific and terrible and it happens and it's awful. But reading in this world, you, you sense like their powerlessness more, their inability to, to act on these things even more. And it, it makes it more frustrating for me. What, how, how do you feel reading about these things in this world if you had to compare it to them in our world? Well, it is a great reminder that we never, ever, ever get complacent about our rights. And the, the minute you don't know your privilege to have uh, other people before you fight for the rights you have now, and you don't keep that up, keep up that work, then we can fall back. And I mean, the we've seen a lot of movements just in the past couple of years of people finally speaking out. But this is this is still happening right now, where people are are not wanting to move forward because nothing will be done, or they'll get blamed. It's still very much part of it, and uh, we have to. We have to work together to make that not. I think also this book kind of shines light on the most dangerous people in this situation, and that is people like Aunt Lydia. Those people are the most dangerous people in this situation because not only do they fall in line with what's happening, they find other ways to, to create power for themselves by taking power from those around them and, and by, you know, I don't know. I, I think I think she's also commenting on those people that will follow blindly or will actively and selfishly make which, in a way, you can't blame, but you can. You can be like, no, that's, you're terrible. You're a terrible person. How could you put the lives of everyone else behind yours? But you can't blame them either because, at that point, she feels that's what she has to do to survive. Um, have we? I'm gonna do this in a coded way, so if you know. <laughs> I'm gonna do a code, and if you know the code, then we move forward, and if you don't, I won't talk about it. Um, does the thank tank mean anything to you yet? Yeah, three women that kind of have like been rising with her, right? The other aunts? No, okay, so no, next life. It's okay. It was along your um, point. I feel like we have read about the thank tank. Okay, guys, uh, have we read about the thank tank? Any comments? I'm. I haven't spoiled anything though. I'm. I'm right. No. Okay. Thank, thank anybody. I know okay. I'm going to say this preemptively. We know, as of yet, we don't know who the inside person is that's helping people escape. I don't know why part of me wants it to be Aunt Lydia so bad. Don't let any of your facial features betray the answer. To I, I am so deadpan right now. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I want... I want Aunt Lydia to be the person that's actually the person on the inside so that she has some sense of like redemption or some redeeming, redeeming quality. They're saying we did read about the think tank. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. I remember hearing about it. 
Because they, it's, um, it, it's when they first were collecting women and bringing them to the different categories, different, yes. different like places. And then um, they would bring the women individually to kind of interview them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you weren't thankful enough, they'd send you to the thank page. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Continue. I think this should be ringing a bell, though, if we did read it. Um, yeah, continue. Keep keep talking about it. Okay, so then, then after being, <clears throat> it's it's really fascinating. I know she's drawing this from something that they really did because they they just make you feel like a, a sub human, like you feel like an animal, and you're put in this cell, and you're just beat and um and degraded to nothing. And then <clears throat> they put you in a hotel and make you feel like a human again and say, you have, these, these are your choices. What are you gonna choose? And then they give them the gun and they say either, are you willing to shoot your own to have like the life in the hotel? Or, you know, like that's where they start testing them to see what they're capable of. I don't know where I was going with this point now because it's been too long. Do you know where I was going with it? I have no idea. I'm, I was listening. I was enjoying this. Thank you. <laughs> but I think that's also crazy. I mean, they, they know that by making a person make that decision, they say once they kill an innocent person to save themselves, we have them. Yeah. They're ours. And I think when Aunt Lydia makes that decision herself, you know, she's like, I can't turn back to the person I once was. But she has a line also while they're doing all this stuff to her that she's like, I'm going to get you for this. And that made me start to view her a little differently because I was like, maybe she's playing the long con. Like, I didn't, I didn't know, but. Hey, Bob's. <laughs> maybe, I'm not sure, but. Uh... I think this is one of uh, one of the one of my favorite books that we've read so far. Her writing is so it's so hard to put the book down. <laughs> it's so hard to put the book down. I think it's I mean, I think one of the reasons why it's so fascinating is because of how not different that world is from ours, but also because it is different. It, it takes a lot to get there, but we just have to be aware of what those steps are, you know. And that's the thing, I think she's also commenting on how these people didn't protect themselves at the different phases when they needed to. As like a society, I don't know, you know how there were different phases of women losing power and then losing, and, and the men and everyone in the country not doing, doing anything about it. All, yeah. all for the sake of, and then how fear was used as a tactic to get these people to do it. The the, the state of emergency, the, the, the use of, uh, Islamic terrorism as a as a means to control the population to say hey we're going to take care of you guys all of your all of your rights are taken away though while we do this so it, under this guise of protection they they take away the freedom and I think that's something as a society we have to be aware of our fear because fear is a very very powerful tool which I think we see in our in our current administration in America the use of fear to to achieve uh, a means. Um, oh, I have a, such a good quote about that. Let me just see. Yeah, please, please. Um, okay, we still have about 20 minutes left, a little less, 15, close, so everyone knows. The other thing I did to make sure I don't spoil is I wrote down what page my thoughts were coming from so I don't say the ones. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I will never do this again. <laughs> yeah, you've got to... <laughs> I don't know. I can't wait till the next live so I can like take a deep breath and like actually talk about the book. Um, one of the while you're looking up your quote, one of the parts of the book I really loved it was towards the beginning, but it was when they were teaching the girls about like their different brains for men. <laughs> oh yeah. And um they were saying it would be so silly to teach women to read. That'd be like teaching a cat to crochet. And I'm like, okay, Agnes, how are you going to take this? Like, are you, because they, the kids laugh because they're laughing because the thought of a cat crocheting is funny. They're not laughing because of, 
of what they're really telling them. And so I'm thinking, okay, Agnes has already been absorbing information. You slowly start seeing her absorb it differently. And she has this rebellious spirit. spirit that's I mean, that's, to me, that's how you know she's Jean's kid. That's, that's, how, that's why I predicted that. Like, because I was like, oh, she's for sure. This has to be Hannah. And so, like, that's also what has been giving me hope this whole time. Because even though I'm seeing her, these people who know nothing else outside of the world can't read, can't write, have so many less skills to get them out of this, are still starting to be like, oh, I wonder why that is. She's curious. I'm like, thank God it's She's not curious. to, like, suppress curiosity somehow in some of these young girls and so she when they say that it'd be teaching cats to crochet she goes okay well that's interesting because it feels like that's not a parallel because one cats don't want to crochet and i was like girls gonna do like i have so much hope for you now like thank you like i just love agnes you know you know what i want like if i could have my ideal world in this book i want agnes and jim and uh Agnes and Daisy to like meet, and then I want them to like start a rebellion, find June, and then like Star Wars rebellion, take down the man type. Like, like I, I don't know why I'm feeling like a. I, I, but that's the thing that I think is the main difference. Like we've talked about, I'm gonna say it one more time between this book and The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale felt like this bleak narrative entering us into a possible what could be, whereas The Testament feels like hope. It feels like we come into this world and we see that no world is without hope. As long as one person is willing to stand up and do something, other people could too. I, I, I'm liking this one better than The Handmaid's Tale because of that. I don't feel as beaten by the system. I feel like there's still a chance for us to, to go. Because we're at a different part of, of yeah. people have had time now with this like 15 years or whatever's passed to actually figure out the weaknesses in the system. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I just got so excited when she said cats don't want to crochet because I'm like, girl wants to read. She wants Oh, and it. then she was like, and we're not cats. Yeah. Like, and she's like, and we're not freaking cats. Like, I don't jump around on nimbly bimbly from tree to tree. Nimbly bimbly. That's a super troopers quote. Um, <laughs> but like, I, and I totally get that. And I, you know what? And talk, talk about male privilege, but you never see men being compared to anything but men or, or humans, you know, in, in any narrative, they, they, they break if they're, you know what I mean? They never, I don't know. It's just something that I'm like, that's. Although at the beginning of like the rounding up of people, they just killed all of the men. They. I'm assuming they had to collect some of them to be in the army, though. That would have been smart. But a lot of I men, feel like that's... Like... Go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say, I feel like it's very Game of Thrones in the sense, like, all right, either you join the regime and you might have a position of power, or you go to the Night's Watch. Whereas women were resources because they could potentially produce children. More men. Or, Yeah. <laughs> more men um or they could be martha's whereas like they didn't have like use yeah and really quickly my dad everyone say hi to my dad uh he goes is that a political statement for today remain hopeful your actions count and you know what i think definitely this book more so is commenting on today in the sense of what our power still is then i think Handmaid's Tale was. Well, think you know? about the time she wrote the books. She wrote exactly. Um, you know, right after the world had basically gotten to Gilead at mm -hmm. the time, and then she wrote this book now, where we, I think, people are seeing in certain countries where we're like, oh, our powers maybe being questioned here, or maybe we're losing some of our rights. And people are coming together and protesting and exercising what it means to live in a democracy and what it means to have the, the, a voice 
and why that's not something we can be ever, ever, ever complacent about when you, that's your responsibility as a member of a democracy. Exactly. My goodness, we're already almost down to like 10 minutes left. So because we only have about like 10, 15 minutes left, should we start going to the favorite quotes? Should we move on to quotes, everybody? Sure. Yeah, let's move on to quotes. <laughs> Pops, thank you for that, though. I, I, I think that is something that you're seeing from this book is like every person at some point is forced to make a choice. We saw Aunt Lydia was forced to make a choice and she chose to be in it for herself and maintain some semblance of power. And then maybe we're seeing her fight back. Don't lose sight. The movements and power comes from uniting individual efforts. I think Daisy is forced to make a choice right now. And she's choosing to actively choose for herself for once what direction her life is going to move in. I think what she's doing is the scariest thing you could ever do. Um, I don't think as a woman, I would be brave enough to do. Yes. And Rita, I'm not going to lie. I was so I, I was waiting to bring up Viva Vendetta because that's exactly what I feel like it, since we were like November 5th was not too long ago. I was like, totally makes sense. But I'm excited to see what choice Agnes makes when she gets the chance, because she keeps alluding to this idea of choice when she's like, uh, she doesn't want to be married. You know, eventually she's in a different position where she doesn't have to, where she's able to look up records and she's, you know, I think we're going to find out Agnes gets to make a choice one day too. And I think that's part of what this book is about is the choices that these women and people make. A lot of men made the wrong choice and decided to promote this world that we're seeing in Gilead. A lot of people made the choice to fight against it and are now dead. And there are peop other people that are still actively making choices for and against this world to either keep it strong or to tear it down. And then we'll find out whose choices I think overcome that. Um, but I think that's actually, I, w I would like to say a theme, a theme of choices. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is like, it's all fine and dandy to tell the these women that they're being protected by them having all these rights removed, but it doesn't matter if you take some choice away. That's, I mean, that's, that's what people will fight to the death for. Exactly. Um, I'm going to start reading quotes. If that's cool T. So yes, we have, yes. uh, knowledge is power, especially discreditable, discreditable knowledge. I thought that was a really cool quote. Um, any forced change of leadership is always followed by a move to crush the opposition. The opposition is led by the educated. So the educated are first to be eliminated. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why I can't stand when people uh, attack. You know what? That's, that's getting very political. So I'm going to take that back. Um, you hold it in, whatever it is, until you can make it through the worst part. Then once you're safe, you can cry all the tears. You couldn't waste time crying before. I think that's a comment on like humanity just being very, uh, the ability to move forward to like. It's the way your I body think... fights sickness too, is you, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're really busy, your body will be like, okay, I don't have time to get sick right now. And then the second you have a moment to rest, your body's like, okay, now we can fight this. Now we can actually process what's going on. Um, and, and the mind does the same, same thing. Uh, Rita brought up this quote. I think it's from here, right? Uh, All men are not like that girl, she would say soothingly. The better kind have superior character. Some of them have decent self-restraint. And once you're married, it will seem quite different to you and not very fearsome at all. Not that she would know anything about it since the aunts were not married. They were not allowed to be. That's why they could have writing in books. We Except and her that you're still forced to be with someone you probably don't want to be with. At all. It doesn't matter. Um, nice. I found her original name. For me, it was like finding a handprint in a cave. It was a sign. It was a message. I was here. I existed. I was real. I, that part kind of broke my heart a little bit. Um, one person alone is not a full person. We exist in relation to others. I was one person. I risked becoming no person which Aunt Lydia exactly became. Um, Aunt Lydia had the chance to make a choice, yet she made literally the worst one. 
having a choice isn't always the best thing if you don't know how to use that privilege. Thank you, Rita. I think that's one of the things she's commenting. She's like, look, everyone got a choice, but look at how drastically different these choices that were these. But I, I still felt like she thought if she was gonna have further choices, she had to be in a position of power to use that. Like she hasn't eliminated her choice yet. And she's probably one of the few women in that world that has any semblance of power to do anything. You know? Mm -hmm. Papu says that leadership and education. Um, in the book, Aunt Lydia is the one referencing. She's the one saying from what she saw and what she knows. She's like, in these regimes, they go for the educated. And the educated will be the ones leading the rebellion. Right. So once they take away the educated, all they're left with is the people that will follow blindly. Yeah, um, me, me is that and she's true. saying that as a person in, in a position of power in this authoritarian regime. And then, right? yeah, like she broke down the whole thing. It's like target the enemy, which the educated, and then break them down to until they lose their identity and any semblance that they felt like they're human. So that's like the personal hygiene part, which they did to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then build the fear by witnessing punishment, using uh, force. It's just like, it's like, it's, it's like a checklist. Mm -hmm. Which I think is kind of cool. Cause I mean, I think we're seeing this attempt in, in the world today in different ways. And I think this book, maybe it's because of the time we're reading it in. I think people 10 years, 20 years from now, hopefully will read this book and be like, wow, that reminds me kind of of this time, you know? Or maybe when our kids read this book one day, they'll be like, oh my God, can that really happen? And we'll be like, we saw it almost happen. And history has seen this happen before. That's the thing. Like, it's not like we haven't seen this happen before. Right. I mean, she's drawing from real life events. Exactly. Just nuts. It's, it's, uh, it gives me shivers. Um, I can't wait to finish this book. Yes. Um, Paula said Aunt Lydia didn't only choose selfishly to survive, but also to be able to get revenge, whatever it would cost. And that, see, that's the important line that I saw in her whole story was like, cause at first I'm like, oh my gosh, I... I thought she genuinely wanted to help these women because she believed what she was saying. And then not to find out she was just trying to survive made me angry. And then when I saw she was going to get revenge, I was like, I will hold out on placing judgment when I see you get revenge and be satisfied <laughs> by it. <laughs> but, um... Three minutes, someone said. Oh my goodness. All right. So uh, thank everyone. For, uh, thank you everyone for joining this first live on The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed lately, we've been meeting every two weeks yeah. instead of weekly. Uh, it gives us more time to read. And, and frankly, for my schedule right now, that's kind of been working. So I'm wondering if that's okay with everyone if we meet in two more weeks and we finish the book. Does that sound good to everyone? Because then we won't have to worry about talking until we have all finished it. I did, um, I did it's still, though, right? What? I, I did okay. <laughs> you, I think you did great, T. I think you did okay. great. Um, is that okay? If, if we finish, sorry, T. Uh, if we finish the book by the 20, and then on the 24th, we, we finish. Does that work for everyone? Tessa, does that work for you? That works perfectly. We're on fire. So I was reading one of the comments. <laughs> I wanted to give yourself more choices. Yes. Um, I didn't read the books. I had to study a lot. That's okay. We're not answering that question because we don't know. I All right, I'm we're running out of time. Look. Um... Guys, what a great book. I'm so happy we're reading this. Thank you, Alberto, for um, putting this as part of the book choices. No, I'm, I'm so happy about it as well. 
And I, I mean, I said it as soon as we found out this was going, this book was going to come out. We're like, we're going to read this. Like, it was so Your exciting. Back to her who shoots on seeing the comments. Very. What what happened? Sorry. We're going to run out of time. That'll be the last thing. Um. All right. So finish the book, and then we talk about it in two weeks. Um. Yeah. Three pairs of pops. Why are you telling your mom about three pairs of shoes? <laughs> <laughs> okay so um all right so this is what we're going to do we are going to finish the book and then i will talk on sunday i will text about what we're what we're doing two weeks from now we will finish the book i'll probably just keep us posted about where we should be but in two weeks we will have our last slide for this and then we will jump into harper lee's go set a watchman for the end of this year which I think has been a pretty exciting year. We've read some pretty good stuff so far. And um, also in that two weeks, I will have the first few books for the following year. Um, be excited, we're gonna get a couple of Hispanic authors and maybe some nonfiction, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Remember, continue to be curious, continue to ask questions, continue to to uh, explore and continue to be positive forces of change in your, in your communities. Um, thing to think about, remember the choices that we all get every day and, and think about how you're using them. I think that's one thing my book, for me, this reading has done so far. It's like actively looking at the choices I make and kind of being like, wow. Take advantage of being able to get educated. Uh, appreciate the ability to do that and, the, and educate yourself on your political views. So that mm -hmm. when you do use your voice, you're using it in an informed way. And that you're exactly. open to having discussions to learn, learn, learn more from people who don't agree with you. And I think that's something that we have to learn right now. It is okay to disagree. It Disagreeing is, 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 the, is, is the foundation of growth and change. I mean, look at you, we're not allowed to disagree. We should be excited that we're able to have discussions where we don't. Exactly, and we can't forget that that's the most important part of our democracy is that we are all allowed to have completely different opinions. But in that freedom of opinion, it is our duty, our absolute duty to work together towards a better world. And to inform ourselves on what we're actually saying and how that affects not only us, but everybody that's living in our community and in the democracy that it's supposed to benefit. Exactly. So I want to, I'm, I'm really happy we're reading this book in November right now, knowing that as in the United States, we have a year until our next election. And I, unfortunately, when people disagree, especially in a political sense, it tends to get very aggressive. And I think this book should be a reminder that it's okay to disagree. It's actually, you should hope that you live somewhere that encourages disagreement. Yes. Just like exactly. living here should. Um, uh, but yes, this book gave us a lot of cool things to talk about. Uh, everyone, let's thank Miss Tessa Mossy for joining us. As you guys know, especially with Margaret Atwood's books, uh, as, as a man, I don't, I don't feel that it's my place to, to not only kind of herald the discussion, but uh, as you, I don't know, I, I, I really appreciate Tessa joining us and uh, thank you, T, for your insight and awesome. My absolute pleasure. Love Margaret Atwood. Yeah. And then uh, thank everyone for joining. Uh, we will talk in a couple weeks. I will stay posted on the Rosende Reads uh, Instagram. I'll probably post a couple things this week so that everyone's like up to date and uh, I'll post about what, what we're doing next week. But thank you guys. Uh, keep reading and we will talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.